Vikes now. I am Dustin Baker on June 28th, about four weeks from training camp. I'm here with Josh Fry on this Wednesday. Tell us how you've been, kind sir. Doing all right, man. Ready to talk some Vikings. I know we're going to be doing a little bit of a something the Vikings need to improve this mm -hmm. uh this upcoming season so ready to, ready to get into it yeah here's what we we encountered a 13 and 4 season last year that was totally unforeseen even even the optimists like you and me i think had them slated at 11 and 6 ceiling or 10 and 7 probably we're going to end up predicting uh for this year and then they boom they won 13 games got outscored by 3 points somehow and then with a whimper lost to the giants in the playoffs so what you're going to do for the group today, the guys and gals out there in YouTube land, is tell us four statistical areas of improvement the Vikings need to uplift to either maintain a standard of living or not fall back into mediocrity or God forsaken out of the playoffs. Uh, so that's what we're going to start with. I don't care what order you rank them in. Um, does that sound good to you? Sounds great. I know... Uh... Right off the bat, though, I'm not the smartest guy in the world, so I stayed away from a lot of the advanced statistics. Stuff. Oh, you did? Uh, okay. So, so, so this is gonna be this is gonna be a little bit more uh, dummy down, I guess, <laughs> than a lot of people might think. But that's how, that's how we're rolling today. <laughs> All right, cool. Let me on in the in the cracks of the show. I'll pull up uh, some of the stuff I've tabulated, and I'll fill in if I can some of the analytics stuff. But let's start. Uh, it doesn't matter, like I said, which order. What is one area Vikings football? they need to improve on in 2023 to be successful all right so right off the bat the the defense in 2022 but it was pretty crappy right I, mm -hmm. I think we can all be generally we can all generally agree on that um so I'm just gonna go with a broad number here yards per play allowed I think that pretty much covers everything defensively because they ranked among the bottom of the league and every pretty much everything in terms of passing they got off to a pretty decent start actually against the run and then it kind of fell apart by the end of the season too um but yards per play allowed this is something that i think if they improve this things are going to improve across the board right uh they came in at tied for the third worst in the league with the los angeles chargers allowing 5.9 yards per play basically giving up a first down every single two plays <laughs> I don't know about you. I'm no mathematician, but that, that doesn't that doesn't seem like a really great, really great scheme in terms of winning football, giving up first downs every two plays. So uh, in order to do to, in order to get their high powered offense on the field a little bit more, the defense needs to step up and avoid giving up all these chunk plays uh, on a consistent basis. Uh, that happened a lot, especially with the, the Donatel's uh, prevent coverage and a lot of schemes. I think this is going to be an area that improves with Brian Flores' is more aggressive scheme, more intricate blisses uh, with these guys like Jordan Hicks, Brian Asmoa, Harrison Smith, all the guys we talked about. So I think this is something that's going to improve, but yards per play need to get better in that area. And that is an emphatic uh, point of order because nothing – is more emblematic of a bend but don't break defense than yards per play allowed. Because if you exalt that philosophy, which for some reason Ed Donatel and the gang did, like almost endorsed it as if as if, 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 as if it was cool, uh, you would just say that's cool. We're gonna allow these yards because damn it, we're gonna we're gonna stiffen when they get down to our side of the field. And for the life of me, I've never understood like why anybody would like that. Why anybody would bank their coaching resume on it and just say well it's cool we're gonna allow them to march but when we're ready to disallow that they better look out it's silly uh and yeah i think the reason if you, if you are going to openly tout a bend but don't break defense as your mantra then that yards per per play is going to be horrid and that's precisely what happened uh what is number two number two uh we're gonna stick a little bit with the defense here but this also gets into the offense i went on total sacks but on both sides of the ball. Okay. Uh, so this is basically, you know, sacks are pretty much one of the most momentum changing plays in all of football. Like you get a third and short and you get a sack on that play, force the other team to punt. That's a, that's really great for That's a really great outcome for your defense. Whereas on the other side that happens offensively could, could, uh, could slow you down a little bit. Um, so in terms of sacks, Kirk cousins was sacked a career high 46 times last year. And, Obviously, the offensive line is probably going to look a little bit uh, – it's going to look pretty much the exact same as it did in 2022. Um, so, one, we just need to see more improvement, especially Ed Ingram uh, in that right guard spot needs to get a little bit better. And hopefully we get a little bit better health out of Christian Darrisaw, Brian O'Neill. So I'm not, in, I'm not extremely worried about it offensively with the continuity, with the assumed improvement across the board from a lot of these young players. But on the flip side, 
defensively, they need to get a lot better in terms of sacking the quarterback. They had two uh, double-digit sack guys in Darius Smith and Daniel Hunter. Obviously, Smith is no longer there. Who knows what's going to happen with Hunter this offseason? Hopefully, he gets a contract extension. We've talked about this a little bit on the show as well. But if the, if those two guys aren't going to be around, where are you going to get your sack production from? We might have Marcus Davenport, but <laughs> He only recorded half a sack last year. Like he's really good at getting pressure, but he hasn't been exactly the most consistent guy in terms of finishing these plays off. Then there's DJ Wanham, Patrick Jones. I think they had four sacks each last year. So, I mean, that's, that's decent, but that's not going to be like a top tier pass rusher type of player for you. So I, I do think that they need to get a lot better both sides of the ball in terms of preventing sacks on offense and then getting more sacks defensively kind of flipping momentum. Like I talked about. And this is what should terrify Vikings fans about the prospect of a Daniel Hunter trade. It's not mm-hmm. that we fundamentally don't understand how he wouldn't fit in a competitive rebuild. I get it. He was injured for a lot of 2020, all of 2020 and some of 2021. Uh, came back really healthy, played all 17 games. Um, but if you are going to hire Brian Flores, that's great. We know there's going to be aggression and pressure. We've heard that out the wazoo for five months. But if your game plan to fix the defense that ranked to, towards the bottom of the league and all these metrics you're talking about, if your plan is to tr- trade the two best pass rushers, it's like twilight zone. You're trying to figure out how in the world is this going to work? So I think the only way to hedge this bet, if indeed Hunter is traded is you have to immediately sign Robert Quinn or immediately sign Yannick Ngakwe for another hurrah. Otherwise like somebody like Chase Young has to be involved in that trade because I cannot even remotely imagine an analytics focused football team thinking edge rushers are a dime a dozen because they would go into the season with Davenport's half sack. As weird as that sound. Uh, and then they'd have Patrick Jones, who you hope takes a leap. And then you're chilling with Luigi Villain and DJ Wanham, who we already Wanham, know is yeah. decent. And then, I mean, you're really just praying for an Andre Carter breakout as a UDFA way too soon, just to say he's a starter. So that's why I always come back thinking if you're trying to analyze the Hunter trade sweepstakes, I don't know if they can do that. And then because if you trade Hunter and Smith and your hope is for the defense to improve, I would be like, well, hopefully it's like 24th in the NFL. (laughs) Because if you have Hunter, I think you can reasonably get towards the middle in Brian Flores' first year. So I will not understand it if they trade Hunter. And it's a testament to what you're talking about. The pressures and the sacks, they need to be there. I don't care if Flores just blitzes out the wazoo he needs to have players who can do that and hunter is what a top 10 guy at effectuating that pressure yeah pretty much yeah <laughs> i mean honestly i feel like they should go get a guy like you can go anyway because <laughs> that's a guy that guaranteed he has it over his entire career he hasn't had fewer than eight sacks in a single season which mm-hmm. considering all the bouncing around he's done especially over the past couple of years vikings ravens uh colts i'm missing somebody else in there Ra- um, or raiders and raiders Jaguars. yeah that's right mm-hmm. yeah uh so with with all the bouncing around he's done and never have a year where he's under eight sacks like that would have been the third approaching the top two in the Vikings defense last year. So I, I, if, it, if there's a guy out there like with that for sure production on the free agency market, I feel like you have to go get him, especially at this point in the year where obviously he's not going to get, if he was going to get money uh, from mm-hmm. a team, it was going to happen already. So if he's still available, you can go get him for what? Five, six million, something <laughs> like that. I feel you, you have to go do it. That's a no brainer in my mind. He has that Brandon Cooks itis from about four years ago, where you look at the stats and you're like, "All right, well, he's going to another team all of a sudden. Somebody doesn't yeah. want him." And I think the I think his main problem is that the run defense isn't there. Yeah. And therefore, when a GM gets down to brass tacks in the off season, you try to find a guy who can do both. If you're going to spend your twelve to twenty million, and Ngakwe has never been an uh, adept run stopper. But who cares at this point? Because especially if you're going to trade Hunter, you need human beings that have a bona fide, you know, backbone for production and not just, you know, Patrick Jones, maybes or Andre Carter, UDFAs. You would need if you want to contend for a Super Bowl or at least the playoffs, you either need Hunter, you need to trade Hunter for Chase Young, or you need to sign in or Robert Quinn. So you have you have the sacks number in general um, on offense too. And I think the Vikings are banking on offensive line continuity as being the fix uh, because we know Ed Ingram was decent or got better down the stretch of his rookie year. Ezra Cleveland is pretty good. 
The two tackles are fantastic. And then Bradbury is the big question mark about whether or not he replicates his improvement and improves even more with Chris Cooper in the gang. So sacks and pressures, number two. Number one was defensive yards for play allowed. What's number three? Number three, everybody talks about how this Vikings team isn't going to be able to replicate winning 11 one possession games again this year, right? Uh, So when you get the free points, you have to be able to convert on them. So I'm going extra point percentage with this one Uh, because like Greg it. Joseph last year was uh 40 out of 46 in terms of his extra points. Six misses was the most in the league. And if, if the Vikings are going to get these three points after touchdowns and they want to remain competitive in 2023, they have to convert on them. They have to be able to get these free points and say that we didn't leave points on the board. We didn't let teams get them way back into games because we left all these points on the table. And honestly, I feel like it's a miracle that with all the missed kicks that he had last year, that it didn't really seem to impact. No, none of them much. mattered. Yeah. None of it mattered. It's unbelievable. Year. Yep. Yeah. He, 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 he ranked near the bottom of the league in regular field goals. Like when the game wasn't on the line. And then I think second to worst, maybe worse an extra point percentage. And somehow, yes, even in Vikings football, that didn't matter. <laughs> Yeah. So like if, if the Vikings aren't going are, are hoping not to regress to the mean this year where they're going back to that, like you said, nine, 10, 11 wins, like a lot of t- people expected last year, they they have to get these three points. So it comes down to that for me. Yep. And it's worth noting that hopefully I don't screw this name up. Jack Podlesny. He's still yep. on the roster this time last year. Gabe, Gabe Burchess had been cut. I think that yep. that relationship only lasted a few weeks. And I would normally say, well, Joseph was cold blooded, and I, I, I know Matt Daniels loves him, and therefore Joseph is going to be the kicker. I would, I would, I'm banking on that happening. However, I said the exact same shit about Jordan Berry last year, and then bada bing, um, our very thick punter Ryan Wright came up and won the job. So we've already seen the blueprint for a somewhat shocking special teams transaction. Therefore, I don't think you can fully rule out Jack Podlesny, the bulldog, uh, for this kicking job. Um, it's interesting. He's still on the roster. Do you think it's a shoe in for Joseph? Well, I mean, like you, you said, Joseph was cold blooded last year, but Pod Lesney's paid for back-to-back national champions in college football. So he's just as cold blooded as Joseph as one of the most accurate kickers in some of the most high pressure filled <laughs> moments uh, in college football that you can get in the entire nation, SEC back-to-back national titles. Like this guy's been in big moments and he's come through for the, for, for Georgia over the past couple of years. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't rule out the uh, a, a potential uh, Pod Lesney taking over the job this year. And his problem per the draft scouting report, not that kickers get drafted that much anyway, unless you are the 49ers front office, is the, the uh, leg strength. And yeah. if I recall correctly, at minicamp, he booted a 55-yarder, and mm-hmm. it was like, of course he can do that. And we were told that by, by his performance at Georgia, that wasn't his MO. And I wondered when we heard that, like how the hell is he going to be in the NFL? If he can't hit from like 48 and beyond, you got to be able to, the only way you can get away with having a weak leg is if you're like 38 and people just realize that you've slowed down. Uh, so the field goal kicking the, the gimme points is one I'm going to go through my little list. I'll make this quick before we get to your yeah. final one. Um, third quarter performance in general. Uh, I came up with these on the fly uh, talking about the analytics. The third quarter was an absolute point of misery for the 2022 Vikings. Even during the greatest comeback in NFL history, that bastard didn't get going until the final two minutes of the third quarter. Every Vikings third quarter was rotten last year. I think there's a couple games where it was like, all right, they're not buffoonish, but if I, I tweeted over and over, if they played average during the third quarter, they wouldn't have this problem with winning every game by one score or less. And it's a good problem to have winning one, every uh, winning every game by one score or less. But if they came out third quarter, didn't matter if they got the ball or they kicked it, it was just gruesome. And I think hopefully somebody in that building and Egan knows that that's a thing. Uh, Next is just generalized defense. They ranked 27th per defensive DVOA. It's a miracle. They finished 13 and four when you have the league six worth defense. And incidentally, I think the DVOA even had them ranked 27th as a team leading into that giants game. And we're going, what are they really that bad? It was either 25th or 27th. I can't remember what it was. Uh, And then to your point on the yardage, the Vikings ranked second to worst in the league in allowing chunk plays of 15 plus yards and 25 plus yards. What does that mean? That means that the team, other team could just walk up and down the field. So I think minimizing those chunk yards meshes beautifully with your, you know, demanding that they they get rid of the yards per play, at least near the base in the league. 
And my final one, hopefully I don't step on your toes here. Maybe I will. Actually, I'll wait until my end to see. You you go ahead with yours. Uh, I'm going to go with uh, my final one is going to be uh, punt return yards, okay. honestly. Uh, because Jalen Rager, he came in last year as a guy that was supposed to be one of those one of those players that is more explosive. He has the speed to kind of take a punt and go run with it, you know. Um, he kind of he, he broke off a couple during his career at Philadelphia. He was pretty good at it in college as well. Um, but this past year, 6.4 yards per return, <laughs> one of the worst numbers in the entire league, 26 punts, 164 total yards. That has to get better because the Vikings need to, If again, if they're not going to regress to the mean, and we're assuming that the fourth quarter stats aren't going to be as ridiculous as they were during the past season this is going to be something that they need to improve they need to get in better field position they have to basically just not shoot themselves in the foot when they get again these free chances these extra points the punt returns all this stuff they have to convert and they they can't they can't just shoot themselves in the foot over and over again which they did constantly last year yeah i think that's one of the reasons that it's a fashionable thing to forecast Jalen Rager's cut from the 53 man roster because (laughs) our lasting memory of him was the, the Colts was it the Colts or the giants game where I think it was the Colts game where he was a Colts. Yeah. yeah. He, he allegedly caused two interceptions with poor route running. And if you're going to do that type of shit, then you got to at least break off one or two punt return touchdowns, make up for yourself throughout a 17 game season. Didn't do either one. Only thing he really had was that nifty rushing touchdown against somebody uh, early in the season. So I think all, both of those factors, kind of show the bad light at the end of the tunnel for Rager, especially when they signed Brandon Powell, who's just, you know, the the wish.com version of Jalen Rager without yeah. the, the draft stock. Uh, so the punt returns, yeah, and I think I think either Powell or one of these UDFA wide receivers, I don't know their, their acumen to return punts, but I'm guessing that they have a couple guys that have the speed. Um, my final one on, on this topic of stats that need to improve – I think it's on the way is flat out just more rushing yards or when they rush the ball, more efficiency Uh, the season was saved because of Dalvin cooks home run touchdowns last year in general and in the running game. And that kind of propped it up to make the Vikings not near the bottom of the league, but they didn't run the ball very much. They ranked third worst or third least in play calling percentage for running the football. And when they did their DVOA and running was 27th. And it's like, I understand we're in a pass happy league. What'd you expect from the former quarterback? Of course, he's going to throw it. But if you want to close out football teams and not have one score games, you got to be able to run the football kind of like Zimmer like to do and just totally demoralize the opponent. There's some drives you don't even need to throw, just run it, run it, run it. And then perhaps you seal it with a, a touchdown pass or something that needs to come back to an extent for the Vikings. You can start your game plan with, oh yeah, well, we're a pass happy team. But it doesn't work anymore to just, yeah. or it doesn't work in general. I think there's a fascination that we're pass happy. Yeah, it's great. Do it on first, second down. But when it gets down to brass tacks in the third quarter and you're up by 17 points, just run the ball, you know, keep the time of possession uh, afloat. I thought that was going to be one of your ones on here was the time of possession because that it was should have been, honestly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's been a problem for the past couple of years. And usually when you see a team with poor time of possession, especially if it's a good team, it's because they can't really run the football. Yeah, for sure. And I, going back to the chunk place thing, I think that's just especially just astounding because mm-hmm. the entire point of Ed Donatel's defense was to prevent teams from <laughs> doing that sort of thing against you. And they still did it the second most times in the entire league. Like it's yeah, that, that, that whole defensive scheme was just an absolute mess last year. Hopefully that gets a little bit better. And yeah, if I re- it does. Then I think we're looking at a team that if they stay as explosive as they were offensively last year, do a little bit more with the rushing game, get a better defense, more aggressive and just stop some of this chunk play stuff. We're looking at a team that's pretty complete and can definitely compete for a Super Bowl. And that's why Hunter needs to stick around because yes. he's the the defense's top player. I don't think there's any argument there. And it would send, A, a mixed signal if you traded him, and unless it's for Chase Young. I keep throwing that out there because he's allegedly whispered in the trade rumor mill. It would seem like a crazy thing to do to get a rookie with a high upside in terms of edge rusher speak. There probably isn't anybody higher on that list than than Chase Young. Um, But yeah, the the sky truly is the limit because if you think how the Vikings won 13 games with the defense that ranked near the NFL's seller, well, we all know that they're not going to go 11-0 in one-score games once again. 
but that won't matter if the defense is ranked 15th or 16th in DVOA or points allowed because you'll they'll make up for each other. Yeah, hopefully they don't go 11 and 0 in one score games because they just don't have that many one score games this year, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they're, they're they're winning these games by 10 plus points, and then we don't have to stress through them all the time. <laughs> yeah, speaking of which, I I need a little bit more time to see training camp and then see what the Buccaneers are up to. But my one of my bold predictions, I think, is that alas, the Vikings are going to beat somebody handily right out of the gate. Um, because yeah. if you let's face it, the Buccaneers game. I challenge viewers to pull out the Vikings schedule on your on your phone. Buccaneers game is probably the easiest game on the schedule. A because it's, it's the at only home. Gimme. Yeah, it's the A because it's gimme. at home, and B because Tom Brady doesn't play there anymore. And then after that, it's the rest. Like you're trying to define easy games as the Saints at home right. or the Bears at home or going to the Falcons. I think the Buccaneers is the only one that <laughs> it, it, it gets really dicey here because then you can't. Uh, show up and like lay a a turd like they did in 2015 against the San Francisco 49ers in Monday night football. But the last time the Vikings beat somebody by 17 points or more was 2019 at the Los Angeles chargers. That was the game where Afadi Adembo had a defensive touchdown. I think they won 39 to 10 Vikings fans just totally overtook the, the stands like the chargers have a notorious fan output as it is. That was the last time they beat the shit out of somebody. So I think my bold prediction, unless some injury happens, is that the Vikings will win like, I don't know, probably right at 17. It'll be like 34-17 over the Buccaneers. Uh, I need a little bit more time to solidify that because you kind of you can kind of feel a vibe from training camp how a team's going to be. Preseason really yeah. doesn't matter. I think, weren't the Vikings 0-3 in the preseason last year? They sure were, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's, it's been a minute since they've won a preseason game, honestly. <laughs> yeah, well, well, we got Jaron Hall now. We're going to be fine. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right, my man, uh, let's get let's get together next Wednesday, and we'll figure out a topic by then. But you have a wonderful week, okay, sir? Sounds good. You too, man. All right, take it easy.